to the computer. Oh, that sounds official. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. Today, I am excited about my next guest, Mr. Orny Frager, who is with the Plant Studio Recording. But before I introduce you to him, I want to tell you a little bit about his background, okay? So I'll have to read this a little bit. So Orny has led a pro prolific career as a recording engineer, producer, and studio owner, working with a huge gamut of musical greats from across the stylistic continuum. Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Joe Poss, Claire Fisher, Paul McCartney, Santana, Michael Jackson, Prince, and many more. He also signed and produced the first album for Beyonce and Girls Time in the early 90s at the Plant Studios. He also owned Spectrum Studios on Venice Beach from 73 to 82, Mars Studios in Hollywood from 82 to 83, the Hollywood Central Studios from 84 to 86, and then most recently the Plant Recording Studios from 1988 to 2008, and now he's with his own The Plant Studios record company. Before I introduce you to him again, I want to actually walk down memory lane to let you know how instrumental Arnie was in my music career. I met Arnie when I was actually the receptionist at KKSF Radio. He actually came into our studio to meet with Tim Pozar, who was our engineer. And so while he was waiting for Tim, he decided to come over and start talking to me. So we started talking about music. He was telling me about he had just finished up some Gerald Levert pro, uh, record he was working on. And just, you know, every time he would come, we'd talk about music. And then one day he says, you know what? This isn't all you do. He's, behind, you know, sitting behind his desk as the receptionist. And I was like, you're right. So then he says, one day you're going to come work for me. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, why would that be? He says, because I'm going to buy the plant recording studio. And I said, yeah, well, when you do, call me. Okay, lo and behold, not long after that, I get a phone call. He purchased the plant recording studios and history was made. I told Arnie I wanted to be an image consultant to address artists for their album covers and videos. Why did I tell him that? I wasn't ready. At least I didn't think I was. Because the next thing I know, he had Michael Jeffries call me, who was actually working on his debut album that was being produced by Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. And at the time, they were the hottest producers going. Can you believe that's how I got introduced as an image consultant? And as you know, I teach it now at City College at San Francisco. So that's how Mr. Arnie Frager was instrumental in my career. So Mr. Frager, welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm good, Kelly. It's great to see you today. Thank you. Thank you. So now, Arnie, you have such an illustrious career, and I just touched on a tad bit of it. So I'd like for you to tell the audience, how did you get involved in the music industry? And then also make sure that you include how you ended up working with Beyonce when she was like 13 years old. Well, I uh, was fortunate in that my mother was very encouraging of me as a musician. I started piano lessons at the age of five okay. because I was a rather unruly child that uh, they couldn't tame, they told me, until I f they discovered that I loved music. Uh, so they started me on piano lessons and I studied piano from the age of five until the age of 18. And then I switched as my main instrument, I switched to studying uh, the string bass, the upright bass uh, when I was 12. So I have been a musician since I was very young and starting as a teenager, I started playing the bass in popular bands, uh, different kinds of music uh, of the time, blues, jazz and pop music. And uh, as a piano player, it was really easy for me to adapt to being a bass player because the bass is basically the left hand of the piano. When, and I was already, by the time I studied bass, I was already a pretty accomplished pianist and my parents thought I was gonna become a concert pianist. Uh, but when I went to school, I, I, I was very interested in technology and unfortunately I, 
I was so good in physics and math that I wound up being an electrical engineer in college. I say unfortunately because uh, when I think back on my life, I, I would have rather continued as a performer in a band, uh, <laughs> which I eventually, in my late twenties, I I I was. Uh, had given up on playing music as a career. And I was in the field of uh, computers and selling computer systems because I got my degrees in college in, in the electrical engineering and computer science field. But in my late 20s, I realized that I was not satisfied being in the computer field. I really wanted to be in the music field. So I just dropped out completely of the career I had and moved with my band to LA and Venice Beach to try and make it as a bass player in a Ma Vishnu Orchestra kind of band, as a fusion rock jazz band. And the band was called Spectrum. And we were encouraged and signed by a producer whose name was Bumps Blackwell, hmm. uh, who was the uh, producer and manager of Little Richard and Sam Cooke. Oh, wow. uh, and was well known in the in the world of R and B and gospel uh, because he had had in his band Jimi Hendrix and Quincy Jones who were in wow. the Blackwell Orchestra. That's exciting. So, so in the early seventies, uh, we staged a concert, and uh, Mr. Blackwell came and said, "Well, I think your band deserves a record deal," and he signed us to a record contract, and we went to L.A. to make it. And while we were in LA, I lived on Venice Beach and I thought we were gonna blow up and become the next big band. So I told this girlfriend of mine, let's see if we can't find a building right on the Venice Beach, right on the sand, uh, <laughs> which she did. She found it, a building and I leased the building thinking that my band was gonna be stars and we'd need a place to hang out. And of course the uh, plans you make when you're having dreams of grandeur, uh, it didn't work out. The record didn't really do anything and the band went their separate ways. Although it was a pretty good band, uh, we went our separate ways and there I was stuck with this building. And I thought, well, what am I gonna do with this building? I wanna be in the music business. So I went around Hollywood and asked all the people if I could start a recording studio on, on the beach. I thought it was a great idea. And everybody said, well, do you have do you have a half a million dollars to start a studio? And I said, I have five thousand dollars. And they said, Well, you nobody's gonna come to Venice Beach. All the recording studios are in Hollywood or Burbank. And five thousand dollars isn't even even in the ballpark of what you need. <laughs> so that's a bad idea, kid. And uh, I just ignored all that and I started doing little demo tapes for people because I still hadn't figured out what I was gonna do in the music business. And that led to um, a four track demo studio that became an eight track demo studio that became a 16 channel real studio by about 1970. We started in 1973, but by 75 and 76, we were recording Bud Shank and Ray Brown and the LA Four and Joe Pass and Little by little, I learned how to become a recording engineer, although it wasn't my original plan. I thought I was gonna be a bass playing superstar. Now, that is amazing that how that turned, but you enjoy being an engineer too though, or at least it well, seems like it. Well, I love being an engineer because the recording studio sort of became my instrument. It's like uh, if you're a guitar player, you have a great guitar and that's your instrument. I switched from being a piano player to a bass. I switched from being an upright bass player to electric bass. And then I switched from being a bass player in a fusion band to being a recording engineer. And for me, the instrument was the studio, the whole recording studio, microphones and mixing boards. It was all new to me, but because I had an electrical engineering background, uh, I was able to transition to becoming an engineer but I was also a musician at the same time. And so because I could read and write music and speak the language and I understood how the guys in the band feel, I could relate to the musicians because I am a musician. Absolutely, and, and you got that ear. Happened. Now tell me about Girls Time. 
how did that work? But before we get into that, isn't today a special day for you? It is a special day. It's my mother's birthday. That's, okay, that's what I thought. So let's and say happy my mother, birthday. My mother, above all people, is the one who really is responsible for me becoming a musician. She literally had to go on two buses twice a week to take me down into Cleveland uh, proper. I, I grew up in Cleveland Heights, but she'd take two buses to take me to piano lessons in Cleveland every week. And, uh, and she, she just encouraged me. So yeah, happy birthday, mom. Yeah, absolutely. I knew it was something I wanted to say to make sure we got that in. Yeah. So now let's talk about girls' time. Tell me well, about that. In uh, 1988, I had moved up from Los Angeles to the Bay Area, having already uh, a lot of experience owning studios in La LA. Uh, we moved up to the Bay Area because my wife hated LA. She just wanted out of LA. And we moved up here, and I wound up taking over the plant recording studios. Uh, but I was really more interested in developing new artists. I had always signed and developed artists in LA. And when I moved up here, I was thinking, well, you know, there's a lot of small groups all over the United States that are um, singing and dancing and rapping, such as uh, the New Edition and Bobby Brown and Color Me Bad. And there were no little girl groups. And I thought to myself, there ought to be a little girl group that can sing, dance, and rap. And I'm going to see if I can't put one together. So I thought I'd form one in the Bay Area, but then I looked around the United States and did a bit of a search. And I found a group that existed in Texas, a bunch of girls. They were nine and 10 years old, actually. Oh, OK. And, and they were in Houston, and they would rehearse at uh, Matthew and Tina Knowles' house, which was also Beyonce's house, uh, because that was her parents, uh, Matthew Knowles and Tina Knowles. And so I contacted them, and they invited me to come to Houston, and I flew to Houston on my, on my own. And they auditioned for me, and I thought they were just the greatest group. Uh, they were called Girls' Time. They had two gals that were managing them, uh, Matthew was not involved. No, the parents were not involved uh, in the management company. There was a couple of gals that were managing them. Uh, the one that I worked with was named Ann Tillman. And I thought they were just great. So I offered them a contract to sign them to my label. I flew them out to uh, San Francisco. I put them up in the Holiday Inn Hotel in uh, Mill Valley, which is right next to Sausalito. And uh, Sausalito is where the plant recording studios is. I took them in the studio and we did a whole album um, of songs that were either covers or they were originals that the girls wrote. And one of the things that happened during the course of the production was that Beyonce wasn't originally the lead singer in the group. The, the lead singer was a girl named Ashley. And Ashley was a a much more mature girl. She was taller than all the rest of the girls and she was stronger as a vocalist, but she didn't have the kind of stage presence that you need in a group. When you have a group, you need someone to get up front on the mic who can really engage the audience, somebody that has charisma. And mm -hmm. when I saw Beyonce perform, I thought, well, that girl has charisma. So I encouraged her to become the lead vocalist. And actually, as we did the album, we had her sing more of the leads than, than the girl that was originally the lead singer in the group. So we did a full album. After that, uh, I wanted to get the album placed because one of my goals in signing groups is to do more than just bring them in the studio and make the record. I've always liked to follow through and make sure the record gets heard and seen by the public. And the way to do that back in 1990, uh, unlike today when you can release a record yourself and have it heard and seen, back in those days, you had to go to a major label and get it released through Columbia or Warner Brothers or Elektra, some, some label that had marketing clout and could get that record on the radio. So 
we got the girls uh, on the American Idol show of its day, which was called Star Search with Ed McMahon. I remember and that. I got them on that show and Girls Time performed on that show. And unfortunately, it was a great disappointment because they didn't win and the, the group they were competing against won over them. And really all everyone who saw the show thought the Girls Time should have won. But they did not win, and they were very disappointed. Uh, I also sent the tape that I had made of their album to Prince, because I had a relationship with Prince. I was working with them in the recording studio every every month, and so I said, "I know you started your own label. I wonder if you would consider these girls." And he called me on the phone and said, "I love the tape. I love these girls. I'll sign them to my label." So that was very exciting, although nothing happened, unlike some other fields where people tell you things. In the music field, people tell you things and sometimes it happens and a lot of times it doesn't. You know, Prince was a touring artist who had plenty going on in his life. And he had, at the time, he had Shaka Khan signed to his label. He had uh, Larry Graham signed to his label. and. I think he just had more, more on his plate than he really could handle. But I was very excited. The girls were very excited about getting signed to Prince's label. That didn't happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Star Search didn't happen. And the third thing was, there's a gal named Suzanne DePass who told Barry Gordy, you got to sign Michael Jackson. Right, right. She was the, she was the gal who really advised Barry Gordy to sign Michael Jackson when he wasn't that impressed with the Jackson Five. And at the time that I was in touch with her, through a girl that worked for her named Ruth Carson. Uh, Ruth was to head up the management division for Suzanne DePass's company. And she had just produced a TV series called Lonesome Dove. And so at that time, Suzanne DePass had transitioned to becoming a very big deal in Hollywood as a television producer. And the fact that they were gonna sign the girls as a management company was a very big deal. And that didn't happen because Ruth Carson got offered to be the a VP at Sony Music in New York and she took that job. So <laughs> we, we, had, we had come very close to getting a major deal for the girls we didn't get. We shopped it to Sylvia Roan at Electra. They signed the girls to a deal and uh, had a producer do some songs. And then when they had a whole album done that they thought were gonna release on Electra, they dropped the girls. Aww. So they what? had, a, the girls time had a lot of disappointments that led to them breaking up. And of course the next group was called Destin's Child. Hey, history. history was made. History well, at least you had, you had your hands in it. You had your hands in it. Well, now, I, tell me, I was involved. That's exactly, for sure. exactly. Now tell me this. I know the history of the plant recording studio, but our audience doesn't. So maybe you can kind of let them know how the plant recording studio was one of the world's most famous recording studios in the world. And you owned it from 88 until 2008, like 33 years. So talk about a little bit about the history of the plant and then some of the people that have recorded there, because I know Rick James actually used to live there. <laughs> so talk to talk to us about it. Give us yeah, some history. Rick, yeah, Rick James and also uh, Sly Stone. Sly yes. Stone had a, had a bedroom in, in, the, in the building. Um, so, okay, the record plant Los Angeles was the king of recording facilities in LA, which as you know, is recording central. Yes. And uh, in the seventies, in the early seventies, there was this, uh, there was a stage of recording, independent recording studios where everybody wanted to get away from the centers. They wanted to get out of New York or they wanted to get out of LA, get away from the record companies who would drop in on the sessions or get away from their families who would drop in on the sessions. <laughs> And so uh, the first of the sort of resort studios was built by Chicago, the band Chicago's manager, Jim Guercio, and that was in outside of uh, Boulder, Colorado, out in, the, out in the country. 
And everybody thought that was great. So the record plan LA being competitive said, well, we, we're going to build a, re a resort studio that's away from LA. So they found a building in Sausalito, California, which as you know, is just over the Golden Gate Bridge. And they built uh, the record plant Sausalito in 1972. And it was famous from the day it opened because it was part of the record plant LA, which was already famous. Um, just to give you an idea of how famous they had, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were at the grand opening party, which was Halloween 1972. Wow. Um, so what made the studio famous in the 70s was Fleetwood Mac did the album Rumors at the studio. Um, and, and, and bands like the Jefferson Airplane, the Jefferson Starship, all the San Francisco famous bands like uh, Huey Lewis in the 80s did his famous records there. Uh, Journey, one of San Francisco's most famous bands did their, their records there. Prince did his first album when he got signed to Warner Brothers there. Yes. At the record plant in Sausalito. Yeah. Um, so all throughout the 70s and the 80s, Aretha Franklin came to the plant and did uh, Who's Zooming Who and Freeway of Love, which was her comeback uh, pop Now, hit. wasn't that the one that Narda Michael Walton produced, right? He did. Yes. Narda, Narda at that time did not own his own studio, and so he worked at the plant. Okay. Uh, until the until the Whitney Houston project and the first Whitney Houston project that uh, Narda did, he also did that at the plant. And I worked. I remember working with Dave Frazier on tuning some of the vocals that we worked on on the Whitney Houston project. So yeah, Narda worked there. Carlos pretty much did all his records there. In the middle eighties, uh, in the, starting in the early eighties, Rick Rick James. He did the uh, most famous record that Rick James did there is Super Freak. She's That's super okay. freaky. Yeah, okay. I didn't know he did that there. Cool. Yeah, yeah. and that that uh, record has been sampled by so many hip hop artists. I mean, it's just a great cool. record though. Super All of Freak. She's super freaky. Freaky. Now, yeah. you know, I just interviewed Carlos Stanfield. And we talked about the Tonys and when they came to the plant, what was it like working with those guys? Well, it was very exciting because I had moved up from Los Angeles and I had just taken over the studio. And uh, it was in my mind, it, it was known as a rock and roll studio. And I thought, well, I'm gonna finally get a chance to do some Northern California rock and roll. And the very first project I actually did there was the Tony, Tony, Tony record, which was, which was a great, R&B record. And I think, I, I'm not sure about the timing of this, but I'm pretty sure that I had just done, or I was right around the time I, I was doing Gerald Levert's first record. It was, because that was right around the time when you had told me you were going to do it. And yeah. I remember before you even did the Tonys, because I introduced you to, to Carlos. Right. Now, you had a Halloween party. Do you remember that wonderful Halloween costume party? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I sure do. Yeah, I think uh, the first party. I don't know which one you're referring to because we did one every year. Once I, I know, but I think it was the first one. I the first I one. I, I dressed up. Uh, I had a lion costume. That was that was it. And, and, I, and, and my I wife came as a lion tamer. Okay. <laughs> and she had the whip and uh, and a top hat. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Yes, I love you that. We, you know, I I opened up the you know because the people in the city were so interested in what was going on in this building that had Carlos Santana and, you know, Too Short and E-40 and all these, you know, Rick James and Sly Stone. So uh, once a year on Halloween, I would open up the doors to the whole city yeah. and invite everybody. Yeah. And we would have, I mean, we usually had maybe 20, 30 people in the building. We, we'd have four or 500 people come to that Halloween party every year. It was a They were wonderful. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Okay, so um, you know what, just thinking about all of this right now is really just taking me back to that time. It was incredible. Um, now, I want you to talk about your new venture, the Plant Studio Records. 
So let's talk about that, what that all entails and what you're looking for. Well, the, uh, the idea of starting the record label uh, came to me from a friend who had finished uh, on his own a beautiful classical album. And the irony of this uh, first release on our label is that although my background as a piano player is classical music and I studied classical music and I grew up with it, in my professional career as an engineer and a producer, I'd never, I, I, I hardly ever worked on classical music at all. Mm -hmm. all, my, all my records that I've done are either R&B, pop or rock, almost entirely. And then my first 10 years in, in the business, I did jazz albums almost exclusively well, on Venice Beach, I did jazz and R&B. So for me to have released as the first record on the Plant Studios Records, the name of our label, I call it the Plant Studios Records, as opposed to the Plant Studios Records. And the reason I call it that way as a verb instead of a noun is because that's what we do. At the okay, time. record, okay. We make records and we record. And so I wanted to emphasize that. But the thing about the label was a guy had this beautiful classical album. He's a virtuoso banjo player, but he composes classical symphonies. And he wrote a symphony for banjo and orchestra. Then he went over to Prague and he recorded it with the Prague Metropolitan Orchestra. His name is Tim Weed. And Tim's a, a Marin County guy uh, who lives in Ross and who is brilliant, brilliant musician and, and composer. And when he played me this piece of music, I said, well, this is such a beautiful piece. He said, but I can't figure out how to get it seen and heard by the public. And that's what I've been doing my whole career as a studio owner. I've been finding people that I thought were talent and backing them and trying to have the public see and hear their music. So I told Tim, well, I believe I could get your record seen and heard because I have a distribution deal with a very good company and we can distribute to all the DSPs like Spotify and Apple Music and Tidal, et cetera. So we released this record and then I realized that having a label was a, was a most direct continuation of what I've been doing my whole career as a studio owner and engineer, which is finding a new act that has great new music and placing it. Because if you make the record, but you don't get it seen and heard, what was the point of all right. that hard work? And so I thought the label was a beautiful thing for me to continue what I'm interested in doing, which is finding great new music and great new artists. And so I started the label and we are now in production with uh, our second and, and our third uh, artist on the label. We, we started with Tim Weed's record. It's called Light and Dark. And it's a classical symphony for banjo and orchestra. Well, well, a beautiful piece of music. Um, and we've released it to all of the DSPs and, and, and uh, we're very excited about the response we're getting and the reviews that we've gotten have been really well, well, very good reviews. Uh, and now I'm working with a bassist whose name is Bobby Vega. And Bobby toured with Sly Stone, he toured as bass player with uh, Santana. He's toured with um, uh, Tower of Power as their bass player. And he's a Bay Area guy who's been in the Bay Area from the 60s and the 70s. He knows everybody in the business. And Bobby and I are working on a record because I've done a couple records with Bobby when he was in a band called Zero. But I, what I didn't know is that Bobby's a composer as well as a bassist, extraordinary bassist. And so we're doing a record that I would put in the category of some jazz, some R&B, uh, but all original compositions that Bobby's written. And we have some wonderful guests that are friends of Bobby's, some brilliant musicians who've played in these bands that know Bobby for many, many years. One of the guys that's going to come over and throw down some tracks with us is Prairie Prince founder of the tubes and another great bay area musician and so we're we're going to have some some luminary guests some great guests musicians on bobby's record and that'll be the second album we release on the plant studios records and then 
I'm in the negotiations to sign a contract to do an album with the third artist that we're working with because the point of the label is not to be a rock label or a jazz label or a classical label, but to be an artist label. Each, each record is goal is to further the career of a new artist. And so I'm signing people that very few people in the public are familiar with. And if it's not their first album, it's their most, it's the album that is most representative of what they're doing today. And the goal of the of my label is to further these artists' dreams, is to assist them in their dream of being successful as an artist. So it's an artist label, without being specific to any one genre. The first record's classical, the second one's jazz and R and B, the third one will be a rock and pop record. So I'm excited because I'm going to be helping you do this because we're going to talk about artist development and making sure that we get these artists and really help mold them and give them the kind of attention and care that record labels are no longer doing. So tell me this, how are you seeking the talent? How are you going about your search? Well, that's a very good question. Um, it's not any one it's not any one process. It's a question of putting the word out to people that you know. I know a lot of people in LA and New York in the music business. I know a lot of uh, music attorneys. So I tell people I've started a label and right now we're putting investment money into the label so that we can do more. Um, and that I'm really looking for uh, people that are new not necessarily new in age, but new as an artist that the public does not know, but new with that have original music. I'm very interested in exciting new music and new artists because that's really the future of the music industry. And, 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 and you, so I remember you telling me it would be helpful if the artist not only was the talent, but that they could write their music Pretty much always, the, the artists I'm signing are writing and creating their own original music, uh, almost exclusive on every record. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So original compositions. Uh, we uh, we we go to conferences. We go to South by Southwest. We go to publisher uh, uh, annual conferences because most of the people I've worked with are singer songwriters. You know, they're, they're not just uh, performers, but they're also composers. Yeah. Uh, because that's really the secret to a career in music is original, original songs, if it's pop music. And even if it's jazz, it's original compositions. That's, 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 what, that's what the future is all about. Absolutely. I'm excited for you. Now tell me this, we're going to segue out of this and we'll come back to it before we sign out. Who are three people that have inspired you throughout your career? Oh my, well, what, what really caused me to leave the computer field and go into the music field was that in the 60s, the late 60s and the early 70s, there was so much amazing music. Uh, in the case of r and I was a huge lover of Motown and okay. Atlantic. And okay. I, you know, I, 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 I was terribly influenced by Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and, 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 and the Four Tops and, and the Spinners and all the early Motown stuff, which has just recently made a comeback with a band called Silk Sonic. Bruno Mars, I don't know, have you, have you heard Bruno Mars' new single? Yes, yes. Is it not wonderful? Keep yes, it <laughs> he's quite talented. Well, Gotta give them up. Give me that point. Well, not only is it a great, a great song, but the performance they did at the Grammys, this is like early 70s or late 60s Motown. And I love that music. So I was very influenced by the music of Motown. I was also very influenced even before that by people like Jackie Wilson and 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 oh uh, yes. The very early R and B was just, you know, yes. Just so yes, great. yes, yes. Oh my goodness. And, 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 and Sam Cooke, a big fan of Sam oh, Cooke, too. So. Oh, a change is going to come. There is no other song like that. 
no, there was no other artist like Sam Cooke. Oh, man, man, man. Died so, too soon. And so the 60s uh, in rock as well, the Beatles, the Rolling Stone. I mean, all of these kinds of music uh, made me just realize that what in the heck am I doing selling computer systems when my heart is in music and I'm, I'm just so taken by all this. I've got to do this. It became by the end of the uh, by the end of the '60s and the beginning of the '70s, when Ma Vishnu Orchestra came around and Chick Corea and Fusion, I, I just realized that I was going to hate my life unless I went into music full time, and that's really what happened. That's so beautiful. that's what influenced me more than anything else was the greatest music of the '60s and the '70s, I would say, and even in the '50s. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh absolutely. Carlos and I just did this whole thing about that very same music. Now, looking back over your life, now listen to this, looking back over your life, what would the nine-year-old Orny say to the adult Orny now? <laughs> well, I never envisioned that I would make my whole life and my career uh, doing music, but when I turned 30, I promised myself that if I was going to try and make it music, I was going to be on the side of making music as opposed to being in the business. Because I have a business background and a sales background, but I didn't want to be in the, I didn't want to be in the business side. I wanted to be right at the front lines of making music. And I would say, the nine-year-old would say, well, you had a dream and you actually pulled it off. You did it. You, you, you spent almost every day of your life in a studio, sitting at a mixing board, recording music that went out to the whole world that millions of people heard. And I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I'm proud that that dream, you know, you have dreams and, and you don't expect they're really going to happen. But when they do, you feel really good about it. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's absolutely. It, I love seeing you get jazzed about all of this. So now, how can artists be in touch with you and what do you need from them? If so, so people that are listening to this podcast and they're like, oh, I want him to listen to my music. What, what, do, you, what do they need to do? How do they reach well, you? Well, you can reach me by sending uh, a, a letter uh, by email. Uh, it would be info at theplantstudiosrecords.com. So if, okay. you send an e if you send an email to info at the plant studios records .com, I will get it. And if you send along with your letter uh, or brief letter and you send me uh, two songs, three songs, I will listen to them, I promise you, because I am always open to hear something new. And the interests I have range all the way from uh, D'Angelo and Tony, Tony, Tony and Raphael Sadiq. By the way, you know, Raphael Sadiq, our boy, he just wrote that song with Andre Day for the new movie about uh, Billie Holiday. Well, he also was a part of the Aretha Franklin program as well. He's quite the talent. <laughs> you know, Busy you guy. Know, do you know that uh, Ray has not only an artist deal on Columbia Records, but he has a production a deal as a producer and as a deal as an artist. That's a very rare situation. I'm very proud of it. That's beautiful. That's yes. beautiful. That's yes, great. Really, really uh, happy. Yeah. Yeah. So now I got to get you back. I had promised Carlos that we were going to all three do this together at one point. Let's do. Yeah, I think it would be fun. Um, so, Mr. Frager, thank you so much for taking out the time to be on Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. It has been such a pleasure, and I will look forward to seeing you soon. Well, I look forward to the things that we're going to do going going forward to uh, make uh, some wonderful things happen for some oh, great music. Absolutely. I, you know what? I am so jazzed and stoked, you guys, to see Arnie and I come back full circle again. I keep having these full circle moments in my life that is just mind-boggling. So I'm happy that we're back together again. And this time we're going to really make some serious music. I'm excited. It's going to be great. It really is. I'm excited. I think so about too. It. Yeah. I yeah. think so too. Say hi to Carlos. for. I will. <laughs> Take care. Bye, Kelly. Bye-bye.